So let's get started for today. Today we're going to talk about both virtualization and database systems. Modern CPUs, as the slide says, are very fast. Modern CPUs, multiple cores, more than one instruction stream, millions of instructions per second. Often, that means that the CPU is idle most of the time. So the probably the most expensive part of a computer system is sitting there not doing work. Sometimes we can get better use out of that CPU by increasing the degree of multi-programming. And when I say degree of multi-programming, I'm talking about how many programs are running concurrently, running at the same time. Now remember when we talked about virtual memory, there is a constraint that we have to have enough real memory to hold the working set of each program that's running or the system will be in that state that's called thrashing. So increasing the degree of multiprogramming is not, not just adding more programs to the mix. We have to be sure that there are enough hardware resources other than the CPU in order to let us get away with that. Remember, thrashing is the case where the operating system is moving pages back and forth between real memory and disk, and very little actual work is getting done. Sometimes we have a need of running more than one operating system. Uh, I'm, my laptop is sitting here running Windows 10 because Windows 11 is not stable enough to use in a classroom yet but it will also run Windows XP and it'll do it concurrently with, um, with Windows 10. There are a couple of programs that I still need to run that will not run on Windows 10 or 11, so I need that copy of Windows XP every now and then. I have done it by virtualizing a, a Windows XP environment here. I could have chosen to run Windows XP on a different computer, but now I have the problems of more than one computer, and the one I need is probably not where I am, and I have to worry about managing and keeping them all up. So, that brings us to the idea of one computer running more than one operating system. This is the thing we call virtualization. If we can run more than one operating system on a single hardware platform, and I can, then we can solve those problems of operating system compatibility without making the hardware manufacturers rich. We can run applications that require different operating systems. We can run applications that require a special configuration of the operating system. We have reduced hardware requirements but remember, there's no such thing as a free lunch. We're going to pay for the reduced hardware requirements with complex software. And we keep those CPUs busy. We use the CPU cycles of that expensive CPU getting actual work done. So back at the beginning of the course, in fact, I think on the first day, I said that a combination of hardware and operating system give us a virtual machine and we talked about the idea that I could have with a different operating system but the same hardware a different virtual machine. So I could change disks on the laptop and boot up Linux and have an entirely different virtual machine from the Windows 11 machine that I have now. When I have operating system and hardware together I expose services not provided by the hardware alone. So I've already said that I could have same hardware, different software, and be either Windows or Linux. Now the idea of virtualization is what if one set of hardware could expose more than one set of services? So Windows 10 and Windows XP or Windows 10 and Linux at the same time that gives us more than one virtual machine on the same hardware configuration. So what are the advantages? 
fewer pieces of hardware. Every piece of hardware is something that has to be managed. And every piece of hardware is something that can break, which if you are in a high intensity environment like a hospital, the fewer things that can break, the happier you are. We have an opportunity for load balancing. If I have a particularly CPU intensive application, I might run that along with some, some applications that are much less CPU intensive and end up with a balanced load on the machine. I can get an opportunity for redundancy or for failover. Redundancy means I can run the same application on more than one machine, not necessarily at the same time. Failover means that I automatically run an application on a different machine should the one it's running on fail. And that's another one of those things that you'd really like to have in the high intensity environment like a hospital. If you pay the license fees to the virtual machine software providers, you get some software management tools that native operating systems just don't provide. So what are the disadvantages? There are free virtual machine packages, but if you're going to use this in a real production environment, you're going to have to pay the license fee because otherwise there's no support other than Google, for example. So another layer of cost and another layer of software, more software to manage. I've reduced the hardware, but I have increased the software complexity, so I did not get a free lunch there. I need more staff skills. Either I have to hire new expensive people or I have to spend money training the people I've got. And I'm here to tell you this is not an on-the-job training kind of thing. There are some subtleties to virtualization software that if nobody tells you about, you find out about the very hard way probably at 2 a.m. You end up with the potential for creating a single point of failure. I was talking about running two operating systems on this machine. If the machine fails, neither one of them will run. I've got one point of failure there. Not all applications will run in a virtual environment. There are some versions of Windows Exchange Server, the email server, that will not run on a virtual machine. Uh, the, the folks who write malicious software have done extensive research on detecting the presence of virtual machines because they don't want the folks who, who uh, write antivirus software to be run, running things in virtual machines and analyzing their malicious software. So there's a, there's a fair amount of knowledge out there about detecting the virtual environment. And there's this thing of more eggs in one, in one basket. I just said if this machine fails, both of my operating systems are failed. So we talked about several kinds of virtualization. We talked about the virtual machine concept very early on. We talked about virtual memory about a week and a half ago, I think. It was a long time ago anyway. Storage virtualization lets us build one storage array and assign partitions on that array to many CPUs. This is the thing called the SAN or Storage Attachment Network or Storage Area Network, depending on who you're listening to. Application virtualization allows applications to run in circumstances other than on their native operating systems. Virtual networking provides separation of network traffic, and this happens in the, in the network infrastructure, in switches and routers. I can separate network traffic and keep, say, my credit card authorization traffic separate from my administrative network traffic without two sets of wires. Whoops, wrong button. Virtual private networks, which we'll talk about on the last regular day of class, which is next Tuesday. Virtual private networks keep traffic on public networks confidential through encryption. Almost no one buys 
least data lines anymore. Uh, people use the internet for that and encrypt the traffic so that it can't be spied on. Each of those virtualization things has its limitations. We're going to talk only about virtual machines for the first half of today. And we're going to talk about databases for a little bit. Two kinds of virtual machines, type one or native. And I'm going to talk about this thing called a hypervisor, which is a very strange word. It came about because early operating systems were called supervisors. The supervisory program loads other programs and, and does stuff for you. Well, what is better than a supervisor has to be a hypervisor, right? And that's where the name came from. The hypervisor, that is the virtual machine manager, runs on the bare metal hardware, instantiates two or more virtual machines by abstracting the hardware interfaces. Okay, we use type one virtualization on servers. The thing that is behind me that I keep pointing to is type two, which we'll talk about in a minute. Type two or hosted virtualization, the virtual machine manager is an application for some operating system. So to continue to pick on my example, the base operating system, the thing that runs on the bare hardware is Windows 10 on this machine that's behind me. The VMware hypervisor is an application that runs under Windows 10. And then Windows XP runs as an application on the VMware hypervisor. There are pictures of both of these coming up. We're going to start with type, type 2 virtualization first. OK, so here is the picture of the type 2 or hosted virtualization. There is physical hardware with its firmware. Then some operating system, Windows, Windows Server, Linux, whatever. The hypervisor or virtual machine manager is an application that runs on that host operating system. In the case of the machine behind me, it runs on Windows 10. I can run other native OS applications like PowerPoint at the moment and Camtasia on Windows 10 without even worrying about the hypervisor. But I can load what is called guest operating systems. And in the case of the example that I keep referring to, the guest operating system will be Windows XP. I have some 16-bit financial software that will not run on uh, Windows 10 and that I am not going to pay to replace because I'm cheap. So I run Windows XP as a guest OS, and now I can run my 16-bit application software. So I think I've already said everything that I just added to the slide. Type 2 virtualization works when mostly what you want is applications for the underlying operating system. So in my case, mostly what I want is applications that run on Windows 10, PowerPoint, some of the Adobe tools, um, those kinds of things. The same hardware can still support other operating systems and the applications that require those other operating systems. So a, a different example, Windows 11 needs access to Windows XP. And there it is right there behind me. I could equally well run Linux or even MS-DOS. Although if you have old MS-DOS games that you want to dig out, there is a a DOS emulator called DOSBox that runs as an application on, on Windows 10 or 11 and that will let you run your disk operating system stuff. Somewhere I have Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game, which I could run and play. All right, this works best when the guest operating systems are either lightly used or infrequently used. So I start up Windows XP about once a month. And while I am working with the financial software, I don't do anything else. So the software overhead of running the virtual machine does not bother me. If I were trying to do both things at once, it probably would bother me. Okay, type one or native 
the hypervisor, the virtual machine manager, runs on the bare metal. Um, there is no underlying operating system. And then it instantiates some number of virtual machines which load and run guest operating systems. The only reason you would do this is, is if you're going to virtualize two or more computers. There's no point in doing it if you're only going to do one, right? Just run the operating system on the hardware and you're done. So type one, it is potentially more efficient. There is no layer of software between the hardware and the hypervisor, the virtual machine manager. Um, a single hardware platform can support several operating systems. It's really when you're doing type two hosted, about one other operating system is the most you can get unless you have a really super duper processor. So some terminology, a virtual machine in the context that we're talking about is a simulated physical computer. It can run an operating system and then we can run applications on that operating system. A physical machine is the actual hardware, the stuff that comes in a box delivered by the nice person from UPS. Hypervisor, virtual machine manager, it's the software that provides the simulation or instantiation of two or more virtual machines. And hypervisor is a, a weird word that is the extension of the old supervisor as a name for the operating system. Okay, host operating system, that is an operating system that runs directly on the hardware. And in that case, the hypervisor would be an application running on the host operating system. Guest operating system is one that's running in a virtual machine. Well, there are a number of sources for virtualization. Zen is an open source type one that is native virtualization software. Citrix has some Zen extensions. Oracle has this thing called VirtualBox. VMware is the 800 pound gorilla in virtualization and they have a whole bunch of other things. All of those have free offerings, mostly hosted, so you can download them and play around with them. I do not recommend using the free offerings in production. And they omit the advanced management system features and probably have some other limitations. So VMware, I told you, was the bare metal hypervisor thingy, creates a VM for a Linux-based server for console management, and then uh, any other VMs that you might need. ESXi, the I supposedly stands for integration, is a smaller footprint, which means less machine resources than ESX. It's a free download, but if you're going to do the important stuff, you need the vCenter license. So, Virtualization, I said earlier, is not something you just decide to do unless you are virtualizing maybe one application for personal use. There are a whole bunch of products available. The best product for a particular organization probably depends on the organization. So VMware might be the best product for some, but if you are already using Citrix in a big way, then Citrix and Zen extensions might be the better product for that organization. Once you have chosen the virtualization software, that's going to drive a bunch of other planning decisions. You can, one could, if one were incautious, use multiple different virtualization platforms. Every one you add multiplies the software complexity. And at some point you have developed that recipe for disaster. Disasters are bad in information technology. I used to, when I was doing information technology instead of teaching it, say it was the only industry in which you needed to know the plural of fiasco. The plural of fiasco is fiasci in case anybody cares.
Italian, right? The first part of planning is to think about the applications that you intend to virtualize. And the first question is, are all of them supported in the virtualization environment that you've chosen? If they're not, well, guess what? There are some applications you won't be able to virtualize. Some resource intensive applications and some applications that require special hardware are probably not good candidates for virtualization. Okay, listen up. This is one of those things like the boss coming in and saying, here's a handful of 12 terabyte disks, build me a RAID array. Domain name system servers, domain controllers, those kinds of things may need to be working in order to start host operating systems. So if I'm doing hosted virtualization, say I'm running Windows Server, I probably need the domain controller to be running on a different machine before I can start the, the host, which I have to start before I can start the hypervisor. So there's, there's a network of dependencies there that you will need to understand for the particular organization that you're working with. Hardware, fast 64-bit CPUs. This is not something you do with the hardware that has been retired and put in the closet. A lot of memory, because remember, virtual memory only works up to the point that you exceed the working set of the applications that are running. Once you've exceeded the sum of the working sets, the virtual memory system starts thrashing and no work gets done. Data center grade components mostly refers to magnetic disks. Although companies like Dell build data center grade servers and consumer grade computers, and the differences are likely to be not only in the disks, but in things like connectors, you're liable to have gold plated connectors in the, in the data center grade components and maybe not in the consumer components. Fans, man, a failed fan in a room full of servers will be unnoticed until all of the smoke comes out of the CPU and then it's too late. So data center grade things like fans as well. Virtualization is likely to mean retiring and replacing some of your older servers. Things that are perfectly good for running as standalone servers may not have the oomph necessary to handle virtualization. If I knew how to do capacity planning for data centers, I would be rich. I would still be here because I think teaching is fun. I enjoy it. But man, I wouldn't been, have been walking from the parking lot with my umbrella. My chauffeur would have dropped me off at the door. Okay. There is more art than science to capacity planning. But if you run too many guest machines on a single physical server, you will get poor performance. And the, the things that you can exhaust, probably the easiest one to fix is memory. Remember about virtual memory and thrashing, which I've probably said 27 times this morning. Um, you can exhaust CPU resources. You can exhaust IO bandwidth between the disks and the CPU. You can exhaust network bandwidth. So there's a lot of stuff you need to pay attention to. And that means measuring that stuff. And when you pay VMware or Citrix or whoever for that license, you're gonna get the management tools to measure this stuff. Keep, keep track of CPU time, memory utilization, throughput on disks and networks, and, and make sure you know what's going on. Do not forget that the hypervisor will consume some resources. And if you're doing hosted or type two virtualization, the host will consume some resources. Leave some slack. Do not compute down to the last CPU cycle and say, I've got this, this is going to work. As it probably will right up until the time something takes a little bit more CPU than you thought it was going to take. You need to plan for storage, either, either solid state drives 
or magnetic disks. You need to decide whether each physical machine is going to have its own storage or whether you'll use a storage attachment network, also called a storage area network. Include your disk storage and capacity planning. Don't forget that the hypervisors, host operating systems, and guest operating systems all take disk space. Leave room for growth. And that is especially important if you have disks allocated to each physical machine. If you're using a storage attachment network, it is often pretty easy to add more disks to it and allocate them. But if each machine has its own disks, you might have plenty of room on machine A and be out of space on machine B and there's nothing you can do about it. The amount of disk space, of physical disk space allocated to a virtual machine can be increased no matter which VM hypervisor you're using. If there's physical space available, if there's no physical space available, um, it's off to buy some more disks. And if we're talking about lots of disk space, which we are, know how the disks are going to be backed up. When we were talking about RAID, even if you do RAID with reasonable sized disks, it's still not backup. If somebody purposefully erases a file and then says, oops, RAID doesn't do you any good at all. Hypervisors virtualize network adapters. So there will be this virtual, this simulated network adapter for each operating system. But all the real network traffic that flows outside the machine has to go through a real network interface controller. And you need to have enough capacity there to handle all of that network uh, traffic. So be sure network planning is included. Some applications, and the example on the slide is credit card processing, should probably be isolated from non-secure networks. Then there is availability. If I'm virtualizing machines using smaller numbers of hardware servers, I have many eggs in each basket. And so now you need to watch the basket, okay? Plan in your planning to avoid single points of failure. One thing fails and you're doomed. Distribute critical servers to different physical machines. So if you have two or three critical applications, don't put them all on the same virtual machine, right? because if it, if it dies, all of your critical applications are dead. Make those plans while you're, before you've bought anything, while you're still planning all of this, figure out what you're gonna do when hardware does eventually fail, because it will. If you include failover capabilities, and failover is a thing where you are running to the same application on two machines. One of them is doing the work, and the other one is just checking, are you there, are you there, are you there, occasionally. And when it does not get an answer to are you there, it takes over. This is really neat, but you better test it before you need it, okay? Business continuity planning is the 21st century word for disaster recovery planning, okay? The change is to send the message that we want the business to be able to keep running. We want that business continuity. And so the business continuity plan of whatever organization needs to include virtualization. Then you need to worry about security. Now you've got a hypervisor which has access to many of the operating systems that are running your critical applications. Remote access ought to scare any CIO witless. It's, it's really good if your system administrator can dial in from home at 2 a.m. and fix this problem that has brought everything down. It is somewhat less good if those guys over on the other side of the world can follow that same path into your critical material, okay? 
VMs have a way of making image and snapshot data, VM hypervisors have a way of making snapshots and images of the virtual machines. They're going to contain your critical data, so they need to be secured. And in addition to keeping the operating system and application software up to date, which you should be doing all along, now you got to figure out about applying hypervisor patches and upgrades and keeping the hypervisor up to date. You still have guest and host operating system security that you still have to keep up with. Then there's training, no matter what virtual machine application you choose, system administrators are going to need to learn to use it. And I told you a little bit earlier today that there are some subtleties in that stuff that will bite you if you try to do on-the-job training. Errors in a virtual machine environment are more costly than a similar error in a single server. Formal training is going to be necessary. That means you need to be able to pay the trainers but you also need to budget the personnel time. If you're going to send um, your top-notch system administrator off to Denver for a week for training, well, who's going to do the system administration? Hardware and software need to be available for training so that those skills don't decline. Man, I used to be just a top-notch database administrator. I knew all of that stuff. Um, these days, if I have to do something with database, Google is my friend. Databases haven't changed, but those skills have leaked out of my head because I haven't been using them. And then there's the budget. You have to buy new hardware. You have to buy licenses for the hypervisor. You have to buy licenses for the host operating systems. You get a free Windows license when you buy a computer, but Microsoft wants you to pay for a license if you install Windows on a virtual machine. Cost of training, both how much you have to spend on it and the personnel time. Are you going to need another body to do more system administration? Will you need, if you need another body, you're going to need more space <clears throat> where you're going to put the person. So I tell people that virtualization will, in general, not save money. It might, it should improve reliability. It should improve manageability. It probably won't save money. And then you have to plan conversion. If you're going to convert servers, that is everything that's running on this machine will now run on this virtual machine, there is physical to virtual software that will help you do that. If you're going to convert applications, then you have to install the application on the virtual server, and then you have to migrate the data. You figure out when and how each application will be converted, and there will be downtime. Do the dry runs and measure the downtime. The time to find out that it's going to take four hours longer than you estimated is not while everybody is shut down and running around wondering when it will be back. Plan for the changes in the domain name system and in IP addressing that are going to be needed. Once you get virtual, monitor everything. You need to notice those developing problems before they turn into fiasco. okay? Disk space is the thing that'll bite you. Probably disk space and memory. But when the disk space fills up, Linux operating systems particularly do not fail gracefully with a full disk. They just crash. Beware of this idea of, we have this new application, I'll just spin up a new virtual machine for it. Pretty soon nobody knows how many virtual machines you have or where they are. And that's a recipe for disaster when there's a failure. Okay, one of the things that is becoming practical in the 21st century is this idea of virtualizing client computers. Not servers, but the computers that the uh, 
that the workers use to work with. The programs run on servers in a data center, and the user has a keyboard and a, and a screen, and that's it. And with gigabit networking, we can actually make that work. The servers then, theoretically, are maintained by administrators. They're patched, they're up to date, and they're backed up. The, another nightmare of the CIO is the corporate critical data that is on old Joe's computer, but nobody knows it's there, except Joe. And he hasn't told anybody about it because he thinks it's job security. Well, guess what? It's not getting backed up. Oops. That's the virtual client model. It is very similar to what I had when I first started doing computing, namely the 1970s mainframe model, where all the computing happened on the mainframe in the, in the air-conditioned room in the basement, and people had keyboards and screens at their desks. Okay, so that's it for virtualization. Let me pause for a minute and see if there are questions. And then we'll talk about databases for a few minutes and finish early yet again. When I first started programming applications for mainframes, information got stored in files. Um, the files were either on disk or on magnetic tape. And the files often contained duplicative data. That is, and one of the things I worked with was a water billing system for a city. And we had a master file that knew about all the water accounts, but then we had billing files. And the billing files duplicated much of the data that was in the master file. The slides has become unsynchronized. If somebody changed an address in the billing file and didn't change it in the master file or vice versa, we now no longer know the customer's address. We got two guesses. We got a 50-50 chance of getting it right, but we don't know anymore. The programs were coupled to the data structure. Every program knew what was supposed to be in the files that it worked with and dealt with that information. So the goal of database systems was to decouple the data from the programs. That's goal number one. Goal number two is reduce duplication of data so that we don't have that become unsynchronized problem. So definition, a database is an organized self-defining collection of logically related data. Organized means that it's structured in a way that we can work with it. Self-defining means that the definitional information, the metadata, and we'll talk about that in a second, the, the definitional data are stored in the database right along with the data themselves. Logically related means that the data describe, here comes the 25 cent word, a domain of discourse. We probably don't have, we might have a water billing database and it has the customer master table and the billing tables and the payment tables and all of that kind of stuff, but it probably doesn't include the vehicle database for the water meter reader trucks. That's probably outside of the domain of discourse and in a different database. Then the data themselves logically related in data, numbers, text, graphics, sound, video, all of the stuff that we're used to working with with computers. Okay, metadata, and meta in this sense means about or descriptive. The metadata provides the definition and also the context for the data stored in the database. This is how databases are self-defining. So when you talk about a database, and I told you I used to know about database administration, you talk about a data database schema, that's the definitional material. So we have names of data items, data type, whether it's a, a dollar amount, a number, a date, a string, length, any constraints on the data, and we'll talk about constraints in a moment in more detail, and any comments that might be there. So the database approach looks like this. Each of those blocks represents a table in the database. So I have a customer table, and the customer can place orders. The crow's foot connector there 
means one too many. One customer may place many orders. I'm one order, I can't belong to many customers. So I don't have the crow's foot at both ends. One order belongs to one customer. The order contains some number of order items and the order items are all products from a products table. So if you take a database course, and I think you do have a database course coming up, don't you? Okay, when you take a database course, you will see this thing. It's called an entity relationship diagram. The relational model database was new in 1970. Before 1970, mostly databases were either the network model or the hierarchical model. And the, the poster child hierarchical model database was IBM's information management system. And it was developed by IBM for the Department of Defense to do a bill of materials for a spacecraft. So bill of materials means everything we need to build this spacecraft. And if you think about that for a second, it is intuitively hierarchical. At the top of the hierarchy, we have spacecraft, right? And down here at the very bottom, I have nuts, bolts, light bulbs, those kinds of things, all of the little bitty parts. And in the middle, I have sub-assemblies that are made out of the little bitty parts. So that's hierarchical. And the hierarchical database works really well when the data model is also hierarchical and it sort of inhales forcefully when the data model is not hierarchical. So in 1970, Ted Codd wrote a paper that was published in the Communications of the Association for Computing Machinery and it described this relational model database. Data get modeled as tables with rows and columns. For each table, there is a primary key. The primary key may be one column or it might be a combination of columns. The primary keys are unique by definition of relation, and that makes each row unique. Each row has its own unique primary key, and so for at least that part is different from any other row in the table. Designing a database requires this process called normalization. And normaliza the goal of normalization is to remove duplicative data, to get that customer address in one place, in one place only. We might not know that it's right, but we won't have to guess which one of two or three are right. With most of the duplication removed, address conflicts and things like that cannot occur. This is good news. There are several normal forms, and for third normal form, which is kind of the minimum for a database, there is a turn the crank algorithm. You do this and the data come out in third normal form. Chris Date, who wrote the book on databases way back when, said that data are normalized when every attribute in a row is about the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. And I'll give you the counter example. Suppose we have a hospital database, which I know something about, and in the patient table, we have the doctor's phone number. All right, this is the recipe for disaster. This is unnormalized data because guess what? That phone number exists for every patient that's being seen by that doctor. And now if we need to change it, we got to find all of them and change them. The better way to do it, and, and this is what happens when we normalize data, is there's a doctor table with one phone number and a doctor number that lives in the patient data. Now I can look up Dr. Hardcastle's phone number in one place in the doctor table. And if it needs to be changed, I change it in one place and it's magically changed for all of Hardcastle's patients. 
The relational model allows us to define integrity constraints, and then the database system enforces those constraints. So a column in one table that's a key into another is called a foreign key. That doctor number in the patient table, that's a foreign key. It points to the doctor's entry in the doctor table. So here's another example. If I have an employee table, I might have department name, and then everybody who is in the information technology department would have information technology in there. Well, if the department changes its name, you've got to find them all and change them. Someone will abbreviate information technology, I-N-F-I-T-E-C-H. And now you won't even be able to find everyone in the information technology department. If an employee table holds a key into the department table, the employee cannot be assigned to a non-existent department. The database management system will say, there is no department 127 and I refuse to insert this record. Go fix it. This is extremely good news. If you delete department 127, database management system will give you, well, it gives the designer a couple of choices. One of them is to just say, no, you can't do that. Got to find everybody who has a 127 in that department number and fix them first. It can say, we're going to delete all of the employees when we delete the department, which may or may not be what you want to do. Or we're going to set the department number to null, not assigned, for everybody who was in department 127. The database management system enforces those constraints, and that's extremely good news. Okay, so producing a listing of employees with department names. I've got an employee table over here and a department table over there, or patients and doctors requires this thing that's called a join operation. Join the employee table and the department table. Joins are CPU and IO intensive. There is no such thing as that free lunch. We got some, some assurance that our data are valid, but we paid for it in CPU time and IO operations. Because joins and some of the other operations on relational databases are relatively expensive, relational database systems didn't really come into use until Moore's Law gave us enough computing power to make them practical. Whether it's a relational database or some other kind of database, there are some properties that one probably should have, and in some cases, and, I'm, and think about financial databases here, and I'll give you an example in a second. Some properties that the database must have. The acronym is ACID, A-C-I-D, and the letters stand for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Atomicity means that I can group a set of database transactions together or a set of database operations together, call that a transaction, and the operations in the transaction will succeed or fail as a whole. Either everything works or nothing works. Example, if I am using Cash App to send money to someone, updating the sender's account to subtract the money and updating the recipient's account to add the money must both succeed or both fail. If one of them succeeds and the other one fails, we have either created money or disappeared money. Bankers hate it when you, when you create or disappear money. So we would put the add the money and the subtract the money into a transaction and the whole thing would succeed or fail. If I don't have the hundred bucks that I want to send to my friend, that transaction will fail. Nothing is subtracted from my account. Nothing is added to my friend's account. If I do have enough money, then the thing succeeds. The money is subtracted from my account. And in one atomic, indivisible 
operation is added to my friend's account. Consistency means that the database is always in a consistent state. And think about those department numbers or doctor numbers for a minute. The database is in a consistent state when all the foreign keys exist in the proper table. Consistency means that we always have the database in that consistent state. Okay, employee record can never have a non-existent department number. Consistency also says future transactions can see the effects of past transactions after they have been committed. Not before, but after they have been committed. Isolation says operations within a transaction are not visible until the transaction is committed. So in that payment app or cash app example, no other transaction can see my reduced balance or the recipient's increased balance until the transaction is committed. Durability says that once a transaction has been committed, it is persistent and can be recovered. Things don't just leak out of the database. Durability is implemented by journaling. Journaling in the context of database says writing before and after copies of the database pages to a journal file every time a transaction or operation changes the database. Now, this is not on the slide, but here is another clue to take with you when you go to work in information technology. The journal file is going to protect you against failure of the disk that holds the database only if the journal file is not on that disk. Okay? The journal file cannot be on the same data storage device as any of the database tables. Otherwise, it has done you no good at all. Okay, and that brings us to this idea of failure and forward recovery. A failed database gets restored from backup. We have backups, right, because we're good. And then the records from that journal file get applied to the restored database. And when we're done applying the journal files, the database has been recovered to the point of failure. We have implemented durability. Once a transaction is committed to the database, it's permanent, it's persistent. So part of Ted Codd's design was a language for operating on relational databases. And we talked about SQL, the Structured Query Language, when we were talking about languages. This is a fourth generation language in which the programmer tells the system what to do, but not how to do it. So you, you will sometimes hear SQL pronounced SQL. When IBM first invented it, it was called the Structured English Query Language, S-E-Q-U-E-L, but they ran into trademark problems, so they did what all good computer folks did. They dumped all the vowels, leaving only SQL. The SQL language has operations for defining relational databases, for updating them, and for retrieving. Here is an example of retrieving. Select from employees where title equals Darth. Okay, we can do that. And it's up to SQL to, to figure out how to do it. The programmer just says, here's what I want to do. And it's up to a part of the database management system called the query optimizer to figure out what has to happen to make that work. Okay, now these days there is this thing called the NoSQL database, which can mean either there isn't any SQL or not only SQL, depending on, on the day of the week, the phase of the moon, and who you're talking to. Relational database systems are very cool. They do stuff very well, but there is overhead. Remember that join operation? That's not even all the overhead. When we have millions of rows, and think about all of the order items that Amazon might have. That's a scary number of, of database rows. That overhead becomes significant. 
So there are modern non-relational databases. We're not going to get into them very much. I hope your database course will, will talk about them a little bit. Often, the efficiency comes from denormalizing. Remember, we normalized data to get rid of duplicativity. I think I just invented a brand new word. We normalized data to get rid of duplication. And the cost that we paid, the no free lunch cost, was we had to do joins on tables. Well, if I get rid of normalization, I might be able to get rid of joins. I've brought back all of those problems of consistency. I have not gotten a free lunch. But now I can do things with a million row database in a reasonable amount of time. I think that is, and it is, that's the last slide. And we're not even hideously early. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Have a good afternoon. Don't get too wet. And I'll see you on Thursday.